No, no, no. Okay, so um, hi, John. Um, so I'm speaking to John Evans and thank you, John, for agreeing to participate in this interview. Uh, it is part of Enel's work on a special issue of the International Journal of Disability and Social Justice intended to mark 50 years of independent living in 2022. Um, the topic of the interview and the special issue is independent living in Europe and beyond, past, present and future. Um, and John, let's start with some questions about the past and the lessons learned from 50 years of independent living advocacy. Um, so my first question for you, John, will be, um, how did you first learn about independent living and what impact did independent living have on your life? So go ahead, John. Right. Um, when did I first hear about independent living? Um, well, it, interestingly enough, with me, I heard about it first in 1976 when I was in the hospital after being admitted with, or well, after breaking my neck. And uh, the, the way this happened was because a friend of mine knew somebody who was working in the Center of Independent Living in Berkeley, California, who thought it would be a good idea for this person to ring me up, being as I was kind of dazed and in a, in a very confused state of mind as to what was going to happen to me. And he did do. And I never forget the conversation I had with this woman, which was very powerful very strong and, uh, you know, right right to the heart. And uh, little did I know that I would be returning to that. So I suppose the seed was left in me from that moment, the seed of independent living. I, I suddenly knew I had no idea what it was before, and then it, it was presented to me. In terms of the impact that it had on me, I, well, it was wide-ranging. Wide um, first of all, it was going to change my life. Um, but before I realized that, I I was living with some friends in the New Forest in, in the countryside in, in the UK. And that all broke down and I had to go and live in a residential home in an institution. And basically, I mean, it terrified me uh, because it was the very last thing I wanted to do. I was somebody who would travel around the world and and um freedom meant, meant a lot to me but when i and when i went into this home i told them that i would be spending the rest of my life there and they laughed it off and thought well you know you've got no alternative this but i never i never accepted that i, I always felt that somehow or other um something would happen and basically yeah i mean it did happen um because um, we, we 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 set up a project, but I mean it did not. It wasn't. I think it, the impact on me was not just about me. It was it was about my personal life. But I think the most important impact it had was on the collective and on, on other disabled people. You know, and that's what blew my mind when we started trying to develop independent living. Is that it was also affecting a lot of other people because we're talking about now in the UK in the late 1970s. And um, what we did was um, was set up a project. And uh, I suppose from there on, everything changed. And then that's when I realized the, how wide the impact of independent living was, not, in, not just in, with me in Hampshire and in the UK, but it was worldwide. So I suppose that's probably, you know, what I'd like to say about that anyway, to start yeah, th with. Thank you, thank you John. Um, so, so maybe now th this is quite a difficult question for you because you've got, um, you've done so much, but what would you say were your, your biggest achievements in all this time? And maybe um, also what were your biggest failures? Yeah, okay, in terms of achievements, well, without doubt, firstly, it starts with the Project 81, which is the project we started in the late 1970s in this um, residential home we were living in. That was the younger people who started, yeah, 
younger disabled people. And uh, it was really an alternative, trying to establish an alternative way of living independently in the community. And then because when we set this up, we did a lot of research and we learned more um, about independent living. We read a lot. We did a lot of research looking into what they've been doing in California and America. And so it gave us a lot of ideas. And then we were able to use that to meet with other disabled people around the country. And what was interesting was we developed a network of people. And I suppose that was a success as well, a network of people living in about seven or eight different parts of the UK. I mean, we have to remember there was no internet in those days, and it was just through word of mouth, through telephone, through um, written materials from different organizations to save people. So Project 81 was without doubt um, the first success. The second one was because I, uh, was, well, I was still in the home. But in 1981, which happened to be the United Nations, you were to say, people, I, I raised enough money, enough funds and got sponsorship to go to America for six weeks to do research into independent living. And I decided to do it in a way, I went, uh, to go to the West Coast first, to Berkeley, California, where it all started, to see how, you know, Cali the Californian kind of version. And then I went to St. Louis in Missouri, which is in the Midwest, to see, you know, what kind of way they did it there. And then I went down to New Mexico, which is where I broke my neck, because that was in the south. And also it was one of the poorest states. So, you know, they were obviously going to have different challenges there. And then finally end up in, 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 in Boston in, on the East Coast. So I had a good kind of um, idea about the different ways they went, you know, in the California, they were freer. In Boston, they were more businesslike. In in um, in uh, St. Louis, they were again more businesslike, and a bit of had a freer, bit of the free kind of um, Berkeley, California type approach. But and then in Albuquerque, they were really struggling because they, you know they weren't getting the kind of funding the others were. So that was a big success. And then finally. Um, the third one would be, without doubt, me moving out of the institution, which was the big one in a sense, because it absolutely transformed my life. And uh, it was like almost taking a drug, you know, because then suddenly I was in my own home, sleeping and living and doing back to the life where I was before I went into, into the residential home. So that was a huge success. Um, but it took it took four and a half years to achieve that, you know. It was painful going through all that time, you know, knew, knowing I could do it. But we had to go through all the red tape and convince the authorities that to do it because nobody could believe that somebody with somebody who had 24-7 support needs would be able to do that. And we were accused of all kinds of things like using the money for drugs and gambling and drinking and all sorts of other things. But we told them, well, that would be stupid because, you know, if we did that, then we we couldn't survive. You know? um, and then the, first, the, the another treatment was setting up the first centre for independent living in the UK, which was in Hampshire. And that was, that, that was a local centre. And then I, as a result of that, we not only developed a network in the UK, but then we developed a wider network of people in Europe and also um, some contacts in America with different people. And in 1989, we um, all converged in, in Strasbourg at the European Parliament, and that's where ENIL was formed. And so that was a, you know, really quite a kind of life-changing event. And uh, you know, it was amazing how, uh, I don't think the European Parliament uh, had ever had anything like that happening when you know, most of us all had our P PAs with us, our personal assistants. And, uh, yeah, it was it was quite an experience, but it, it started that whole thing off. Then when we came back to the UK, the Brit there were five, no, there were six British people who went there. And when we came back to the UK, we decided we had to do something similar in the UK. In other words, try and find a national 
representative body. And we did it through uh, the national organization called BCODP, the British Council of Disabled People. And uh, we set up an independent living group or independent living committee, we called it at the time. So it would fit into the structures of this organization. So those were the five people. And then we brought other people in, you know, other other friends, like, you know, Baroness Jane Campbell um, and Rachel Hurst and a whole lot of others to join us. So, and then one of the, the, the two first pieces of work we wanted to do, I wanted to achieve was one was to get the legislation, um, to get legislation so that not only could we have uh, our our independent living in our own homes, but other people could have it right around the country. Because at, at that time, there were only sort of about seven different authorities that were doing it because a lot were afraid because it was basically illegal in the British uh, legal interpretation of what people could have because um, it said that... Um, uh, the social care system could not pay an individual money, but only, only one could only get it through the benefit system, you know? So we had this kind of loophole well, how we would do it, and we did it through a third party by holding organization, a charity or a disabled people's organization, and that's how we managed to overcome it. Um, but then uh, the other success we had really was setting up... Um, the National Center for Independent Living, that was the second, as well as getting the direct payments at, uh, being our, our main objective, which came out in 1996, which was uh, about four or five years later after we started. So, you know, that was quite a fast piece of, you know, movement because we had, you know, lots of politicians and influential people, directors of social services and direct um, people, leaders of unions, and things like that behind us, supporting us. So that was quite good. So then the, the National Center for Independent Living also got set up that same year, 1996, when the Direct Payments Act became law. It was in 1995, it, it kind of went through Parliament and was accepted, but it was the following year. So yeah, but so having a National Center for Independent Living meant that we had an overarching organization that would support all these different independent living groups and centers for independent living around the country that were then developing. Um, and I think the other, I mean, I think that's probably, I could go on with other successes. But yeah, no, I would mention one other, was the Enel Freedom Drive. That was in 2003. That was when I was the chair or the president of Enel. And it was the idea of one of our Irish uh, colleagues, Martin Nocton, and a whole group of us, about six or seven of us, worked on setting up the first Enel Freedom Drive in Strasbourg, which has now become, you know, um, an event that happens every two years that Enel still organizes and, and still, you know, has the same objectives of trying to keep, you know, personal assistance and independent living on the agenda at the at the level of the European Parliament and the commission, which 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 was great, you know, and that that is still going. So I think yeah, I could get, I could say more, but I think that's enough of the real successes we had, which you know transformed not just my life, but thousands of other disabled people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, John. And uh, in terms of, is there anything you you wanted to do and it hasn't worked out i mean is there any anything you know that that failed um during during in terms of advocacy during this time yeah in terms of the failures for sure we had um quite a lot of failures i think um well not quite a lot <laughs> but you know it never went as far as i would like to have gone we never had the the amount of funding i would like to have got and um and in a sense we never had the full government support not just from from the uk from other countries as well i think they had similar issues um and part of that was because you know governments change 
and you get some governments that, uh, um, you know, are supporting you and others that don't. What was interesting when we started going in the beginning was we had a conservative government. Even the Margaret Thatcher government was, which was always known to be very right wing. But I mean, a few of the, the, the conservative MPs supported us and we were able to do that. But then when Labour Party came back into power in 1997, we probably had a lot more support than finally from them than, than we had had previously. Because the Labour Party were very slow to to uh, take on. I mean, other other let's see, other failures were, um, I suppose, not not getting enough independent living centres in the UK. We mm. we we had quite a few, and probably more than other countries. But I think it could have still gone gone further and uh, and, and, and 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 done that. And, um, yeah, but other failures came later, I think. Well, they weren't failures that were our fault. Yeah. They were failures of the system, you know, but I'll go into that later, I think, when we get it, because that's all about um, the impact the austerity had in the, in, the, in 2010 after the banking crisis. That had a big effect, uh, yeah. an adverse effect on organizations everywhere throughout the world and, and particularly, you know, well, not particularly in this country, but particularly in Europe, you know, and that that mm -hmm. was that was difficult. Yeah, thanks, Johnny. I will get to that a little bit later, talking about um, the present. Uh, in terms of still looking at the past a little bit, uh -huh. um, you, you touched upon the allies a little bit, but is there anybody else you would want to the um, allies yeah um yeah well mentioned. i mentioned let's see yeah i mean i think we've always well like what i would call independent living champions we've always had independent living champions and those were people in the system who fought on our behalf and we had them when i managed to achieve my independent living scheme i had a few people one man in particular who who saw the vision and basically saw this, how good it would be in the future for myself. And then obviously following me, hopefully others as well. So we had him. And I think also like when I mentioned the um, getting the direct payments legislation, we had, again, other directors of social services, some politicians, some union leaders. And so, yeah, we had, you know, influential people. From lots of different backgrounds and and people from you know ngos you know as well some um social care ngos and not not necessarily the traditional charities but even some of the traditional charities actually agreed with us and there were housing directors people like that and um let's see um oh, can't think of anything else off the top of my head but um, I mean, the, even healthcare professionals. Yeah. And later on, we had certain people in the European Commission, but that was very, very hard, you know, to begin with. Some of the people we had at the beginning were, were difficult to crack. And there were some terrible people leading the uh, disability unit in the European Commission. And, you know, their idea of, um, of, of, of supporting disabled people was all sorts of different things like holidays and having these big sort of um, meetings every now and again in different places around around Europe. But it didn't have any substance to it as far as we were concerned. You know, they didn't yeah. have the political clout to do or to go as far as, as we wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that still still goes on. Um, but I mean, in yeah. terms of the the UK, was there anybody? It seemed like you did have quite a few people on your side. Was oh, there yeah. any? Was there anyone who who you'd say was afraid of independent living and put up, um, you know, made made um, things difficult for you? Oh yeah, I mean, I think there were quite a lot of uh, people who made things difficult. Um, uh, I mean, the first that come to mind are the social care and health care professionals. Because I remember one professor of 
rehabilitation. Um, he had quite a lot of uh, power at the time in 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 Southampton, which was part of Hampshire then, and um, he 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 completely was adamant that we we could never that we would never be able to achieve it. People with such care needs um, was you know twenty four seven as I said before. Those people, you know, that we would would never be able to do it, and so he um he came up with this idea, this crazy idea to to have two of us from this project eighty one, the project that we had from the residential home, to go and stay in 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 what was called an independent living bungalow, in a hospital, which was fully adapted with all the mod cons of you know microwaves and supposedly designed for a wheelchair user and everything else. So we, you know, basically I said I didn't want to do it, yeah, you know, and, and all the others said, look, we've got to do this. We've got to play the game here because, um, you know, if we don't, then uh, we probably won't be able to, you know, and transcast. But I said, this guy is never going to change. You know, he's, he's, he's going to hold out. And I'm sure when we go there, he'll make, so anyway, we we gave in and we decided we would go there. One thing I remember when I was there actually was Bob Marley died, which is a big shock. It was, um, but anyway, we were there and and uh, one of the you know we 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 worked with the occupational therapist in that hospital all the time, and in fact we we developed a relationship with her which we then kept for many many years afterwards. And she still is quite a colleague, and he became a friend as well in the end, you know, because she was, she became one of our big supporters, realizing because we were with her all the time, and we were telling her what we were wanting to do and why, she she completely agreed with with all our, our motives and ideas, and so yeah, we did it. And one of the most difficult things we had was keeping our our PAs with enough beer money. To drink when they were off, because when we were in the day, they were going off to the nearest pubs and having a few drinks. And so, but but anyway, we did it, and we 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 you know it was successful. But you know, there was no kind of measurement or no. But you know, because of this OT took to her liking, she basically spoke on our behalf and gave gave quite a good report, I think about what we were able to do and all that uh, and said she fully supported our what we were doing and this this professor of rehabilitation still sort of was was very adamant that well you've done you know but we proved him wrong that we you know and in the end we, well we proved him wrong completely because we all did it and we all moved out but that was one of the worst examples of i think people but, but there were others like i think further down the road you know, we had politicians in this country that were dead against it, uh, you know, as well as our supporters. We had the people who wouldn't, you know, wouldn't agree with us, wouldn't give us the extra funding and all the rest of it. And fund funders were a problem, funding organizations. And, you know, problem was that most people just didn't understand what independent living was then, you know. So it was a uh, an educational kind of practice all the time to try and, convince people about it. But yeah, I think that's probably all I can think of right now about, you know, in terms of, but, you know, those, but those, 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 those people who were skeptics and were against it uh, are still there, you know, they're yeah. still there in this country and they're still there in the European Commission and in the Parliament and, yeah. and everything, you know, we, we still have the same problem. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I don't yeah. think that changes. Yeah, there's always going to be people like that. But uh, in terms of the the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, right. mm -hmm. John, did did that make uh, a difference once the UK ratified the convention? Did you um, feel any difference? Right. Well, first of all, you know the European Convention, without doubt, is one of the most comprehensive um, pieces of 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 rights re legislation for disabled people. And uh, yeah, it's a shame that basically not only our country, you know, our country signed up to it, but it made absolute no difference. And I think 
it's probably the same everywhere. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any country that's fully implemented that, that UNCRPD. Now, and that's one of the problems about the UN is it, it lacks clout and it lacks credibility and it lacks the power, the authority to be able to um, tell other governments what to do, you know, to change things for the better, you know. And they did what they could. And uh, I think the whole process beforehand with the rapporteur, whose name I can't remember now, a Swedish man who went everywhere finding out what he could. He was Swedish. And, of course, because he was Swedish, he knew he knew our Swedish independent living colleagues there. I was very much influenced by them, but he was quite a good guy anyway. And he was also, um, you know, himself. He was a blind person. So, uh, you know, he understood a lot of the problems. And that was one of the, I think, main things that influenced him. But, yes, so, yes, yeah, sadly, uh, it hasn't changed much. I remember when was it? I think it was about 2009, 2010 or 11. Um, the UN committee came, or rather, no, it was the um, the um, all-party disabled disabled group on, on human rights um, asked us to go and meet them. Well, they chose two or three people because it was the time when um, they were looking at, the UN had said that uh, this country wasn't, uh, you know, fully supporting disabled people as much as they could oh, to wow. live independently. And, um, yeah, we went there and they wrote, a, they wrote um, quite a, a comprehensive piece of uh, a report basically outlining to the British government that they were not putting in, they were not giving priority to independent living as much as they should to say that people were suffering. And that was interesting because it was came at the time of the beginning of austerity, you know. Things were getting bad, but not as bad as they would eventually happen. So, uh, yeah, it's a shame. Uh, basically, I mean, I think it failed in terms of, you know, really changing countries, changing the member states, you know, it just, uh, yeah. Didn't, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to think, you know, somehow it, rather it would have an impact and have more strength uh, to change things, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced. I mean, uh -huh. there's a new rapporteur now, Gerard Quinn, and um, I, I would hope, you know, he could push things a bit more, but the governments are very reticent, I think, to take uh, take on, you know, ideas that have come from the UN. Yeah. You know, it's, the same, yeah. it's the same, you know, in the war now in uh, Ukraine, you know, it's just, you know, as far as Russia is concerned, there, there's no no sense at all or no no way they treat, they treat, they, 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 you know, they laugh at the UN, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's that's yeah, it's not so positive. But in terms of in terms of um advocacy itself, John, um and, and fighting for independent living, uh, mm. do you think things have changed in the last since you know since you started? Um and um would you would you um, have any sort of lessons learned perhaps to to share yeah um yeah i mean it's changed and it hasn't changed i mean i think one of the important things which we should forget we should we shouldn't forget um is that um one of the best things the independent living movement came up with and this is worldwide because it originally started at Berkeley, California, and then we inherited in this country and, and then other countries as well, and Ian you know, too, is peer support. You know, the importance of peer support, the importance of of um, the, the positive role models that others can play in their lives to show um, the benefits of what independent living can do to people. And I think that's certainly something that yeah, I don't think it is as strong anymore than what it was, but it's certainly not as strong in this country. And I'm constantly going on about it, the fact that we don't have that as much peer support as we used to. 
you know, and I think part of that is to do with many um, of the independent living organizations and disability political organizations have had their mon money or their funding cut so much that um, they've lost, um, well, not lost the initiative, but lost the ability to do so much, you know, because they're, they're, they're limited in their funds. So, you know, like they just can't do the kinds of things that they want to do. And I think, you know, advocacy, once you become an advocate, you know, well, I mean, I can only speak for myself personally. I mean, I, I you know, I can't change because that advocacy will always live live on inside me, you know, and mm. that's, that's the way I am. So, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people I know are like that as well. You know, they're still very political and would advocate for the, you know, for the right, the importance of independent living, the fact that it can transform people's lives so much and make it so much better than, uh, than what it has been. So, I mean, advocacy, I think, you know, some some advocacy has been watered down. And, and for instance, you know, you don't see so many demonstrations anymore as you used to. Because, uh, you know, I can't remember, you know, other than small demonstrations for, formed by more, more direct action political yeah. groups, you know, like fighting to maintain the ILF. You know, you know, right, right up until it went in 2015. That 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 was going on, and there's still occasional. Um, we had a demonstration about. Uh, it must have been what before. The last one was about five, six. Well, it must have been longer than that, even eight uh -huh. to ten years ago. Major, major demonstration of disabled people in this country. And I mean, I think other countries have 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 the, have some. Sometimes, but it's still not. People don't seem to be as politically active as as they were, certainly not in the 80s and the 90s and the 40s. I think after the 40s and when, when austerity came in, things subsided a bit, yeah. sadly, for a lot of different reasons. But, yeah, advocacy, unfortunately, was one of them that was affected. Yeah. But it's still there. It's still there, but I think it's a, a minority of people who would take that that on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you think it perhaps is it to do also with the fact that things are better than than fifty years ago? So maybe people don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot part of people of it. don't feel the need to. Yeah, that's part of it. It's part of. Yeah. Um, certainly, some young people I think are not as politically active as they were because. You know, they, they can apply for direct payments now and mm -hmm. they can apply for personal health budgets. And so um, then, you know, they they don't have to fight. Mm -hmm. But I think unless you, and then when you have to fight for something to get it, then you realize the benefit of it more, yeah. the quality of it, more than when it's just there and it's part of the system. It's the part of what how it works. But even then, I think, you know, unfortunately, because that's the way it is, um, that's partly the reason I think like, you lose a lot of the advocacy, you know. Yeah, and yeah. A lot of the, the political uh, action and, and protest um, because of that. You know, they, they're they satisfied that that's there, which is sad. Yeah. That's why it's... it's important to try and keep young people alive, you know. Mm. And to keep them alert to it, and to you know, to you know, well, they're the one. The future is theirs. Yeah, and this so is why it's important. We're talking to, to you that. as well. Um. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and th this brings us to to the present, John. Um. Mm -hmm. So talking about sort of the main tasks of independent living advocacy now in the present. What what would you say are the current barriers to independent living in the UK or the, the main barriers? barriers? Well, one without doubt is the fact that we lost our National Centre for Independent Living. Um, I can't remember it was, 2011, 12, or whenever it was, um, which I spoke out very strongly against. I never, ever agreed with the fact that it should amalgamate or unite with two other organizations, Disability Rights UK and Disability Benefits. 
uh, UK, I think, um, because I knew that we would lose the momentum of independent living. And mm -hmm. um, because, because that's happened, um, now we're up against it because we don't have a, a kind of overarching organization anymore to organize things. So we don't, you know, we can't focus our attention in, in that same way. And uh, I mean, a good example was when the Direct Payments Act came out in 1996 and NCIL also came out in 1996. It was able to set up uh, meetings every few months with all the direct support groups that there were at that time because the Direct Payments Act came out. I mean, all uh, different authorities around the country um, kind of, together with disabled people, set up direct payment support groups. And these met every two months. And that was a good example. And that went on for years and years and years. Um, and then when we lost that, things started going downhill a bit. And of course, now that we don't have a centre, because I mean, I think if we did have a centre, a national centre, the independent living, and it could pull together all the independent living groups and, and not just groups, but individuals around the country. And, they, you know, they could organize the, the protests. And I think that's why, that's one of the reasons why we haven't been able to do it. And even when the independent living fund was being closed, uh, it was small um, groups of direct action groups that, that protested. So they were just lots of different individuals who felt so strongly about it that they wanted to go back out in the streets and, and show direct action because in the past that's been very, very kind of uh, helpful for us, you know, in terms of making changes. It brought out the DDA, it brought out the Direct Payments Act it, in 19, 1988. It even uh, brought out the Independent Living Fund because it challenged the change in the well, welfare reform or welfare benefits reform that was going on then. So, um, you know, that's what it shows how much can be done, you know, and that to, uh, yeah, so it's really important to try and keep things alive, you know, and without that infrastructure, we don't, we don't, we don't have it. Yeah. Mm. You know, we need to focus and re-energize our energies, I think, to try and overcome some of those weakness. I mean, ENU can certainly play a role in that internationally or th throughout Europe. Um, and the Freedom Drive, you know, it's every two years, but that can at least sort of help keep those ideas alive, keep advocacy alive and keep peer support alive and mm. yeah, and, uh, and people keep pe people fight or people fighting for Direct payments legislation, PA, PA legislation, and and all those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think the the UK has always been a bit more inward looking, wasn't it? So in terms mm -hmm. of, I mean, other countries tend to engage much more with ENL and the European sort of level, whereas the UK is a little bit more focused on on its own. Mm -hmm. issues so yeah like yeah, you said yeah. the loss yeah, of the national to, center yeah. is, is uh we need to encourage young people I and mean, it's difficult yeah. to encourage them now, now because they're not um and the other thing i think is important in this has happened in this country too in terms of looking at current issues is is around um things like i mean co-production has made a, is now a big thing in this country and we are using that to to try and support the social model of disability and independent living because um, to me, COVID action kind of represents both of those and the mm -hmm. rights of disabled people because it's basically talking about um, um, sort of people with lived experience working together with authorities or people who make decisions uh, in partnership with them on an equal basis. So, you know, one, yeah. So that's why it's important, I think. One of the original definitions of independent living was, was you know, all decisions about a disabled person's life 
sh should ensure that the disabled person is part of it, is part of that process. And that's exactly what, uh, you know, co-production is trying to do. And I think that's that's the main hope in this country, in the UK, that we're working quite strongly in that now. And it's developing and it's spreading, spreading throughout the country. And also what's interesting, it's spreading into the health authorities. Because, that, that, you know, we've always worked together. Uh, no, well, it's certainly in Hampshire with the local authority. You know, the social services, or they call adult health and care now. But we haven't been able to work with the health authorities. But now we are. I'm involved with a COVID action group that works with our, what was the CCG, but now it's called, they, they keep changing the system all the time, integrated care systems. So we're working with them, you know, on a, on a, and because, and that's that's vital because personal health budgets are funded by the health authority. So that's how we've been able to do it. We use that as a mechanism to be able to work with them in, in, in on an equal basis. Uh, and now we've gone beyond personal health budgets because that's all developed now and the system's up and running. Uh, but even, even having said that, um, there are some people working on re the review process, you know, and trying to improve that. Uh, okay, so that's that's something positive. Uh, oh yeah, oh now. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a, there's quite a lot of positive coming out from the COVID action side of things. Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's one of our hopes, really. Yeah. And in terms of um, access to independent living, John, how? What would you say? How universal is independent living in the UK? And I mean, um, mm. does would you say um, everyone has access to it, or are there still groups or oh. places where where um, yeah people cannot access yeah. direct payments or yeah? Well, independent you know. living should be universal, but it's not universal, and the reason why. It's not universal. Is because we have a system that's that what we call the postcode lottery system. So basically, it depends on where you, it depends where you live geographically in terms of what you are going to be um, able to to get. <clears throat> so if you got um, authorities that are very supportive of independent living and and co-production, things happen. And if you've got authorities where there are active groups or organizations of disabled people like Manchester, Hampshire, and some of the London boroughs, and Bristol, and a few other places, then those places tend to be a lot better in what they provide. And that, again, is, is because of the advocacy that's going on in those areas, the constant kind of criticism authorities are taken from disabled people or challenges. You know, disabled people and others are challenging them to try and make changes. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 not universal. It really depends where where you live and whether there's an active disabled people's organization. Um, they're influencing what's going on. You very rarely get it in authorities where there aren't active people doing something to try and change things. And so it's not. It should be. I mean, that should be the idea without without doubt. Yeah, thanks, John. So that's very interesting. So there is almost, um, yeah, you're saying there needs to be constant pressure in order to keep um, keep the same right. Yeah, um, yeah even more uh, so now with, with uh, the austerity that's hit us, you know. Uh, that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is, the loss of the independent living fund 2015 was a huge um kind of loss of, uh, and in those few years when it closed down there were so many people and so many stories of people who had lost out who had their packages even still some stories as as much as 50 percent people were losing of their packages yeah. which is which is horrendous and another thing in this country that's difficult, uh, well, it's not just this country, actually, because I, I know it's happening in other countries, is that we have to contribute. People on direct payments 
a, mm. a means tested in terms of how much of the money they have. And if they have money, if they have savings, then they, they're, they're supposed to contribute towards the cost of their care support. And that can be a, a major hindrance. And that's one of the advantages of uh, the health authority, the personal health budgets, uh, which is why I moved on to it, because that's not means tested. That's free at the access, free, you know, free from the access of, 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 of it, you know, the whole, you know, that's that's the wonderful thing about it. You know, the NHS, but I don't know how long that's going to go on for. Hopefully that will continue because, I mean, nothing is sacred anymore, I don't think. The way things are going, you can't, you can't tell. But that's, you know, a major, a major difference between a personal health budget and a direct payment. And I know other colleagues of mine have moved on to personal health budgets for that same reason. Okay, that's that's interesting as and well. Also, you know, I yeah. I was legitimately moved on to it because I had some health reasons. I had, uh, you know, I had pneumonia ten years ago. Mm. So it immediately put me into the framework of somebody who would fit into continuing healthcare funding, mm. which is where personal health budget came from. And then in 2014, um, direct payments was allowed to be, it would, became legal for health authorities to use it. Mm. Because up until then, you didn't. So you had no control. That's why I never, never wanted people, you know, told me to, to do it years and years before that, but I would never trust it, you know, because of that reason of losing control mm -hmm. of my funding situation and, you know, what I could do and couldn't do. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And this, this brings us then to, to the future um, of, of independent living advocacy. Um, what, what do you think should be the priorities uh, for independent living advocacy, thinking about the UK, but also maybe the whole of Europe, what, what would you say um, uh, would be kind of important? Would it be to, to fight for legislation, for example, to overcome this postcode lottery or mm -hmm. um, something else? Well, that's exactly why we fought for the Direct Payments Act, to try and overcome that, mm. and which we did do to a certain extent. So it did at least, it made it legal for all authorities to provide a direct payment. But as you know, and I know that they all didn't, you know, or at least some just did it in small dosages as it were. And others, you know, went from nothing to everything. So, you know, there was a, a wide variety. So yeah, they've got to keep on campaigning, campaigning for legislation to be able to do that. And that's why, you know, the UNCRPD would be so important if that could be embedded and implemented in all countries' legislation. But, you know, you know, since austerity, we've got so many things to, to fight for now. It's um, basically what we've been doing since 2010 is firefighting. It's been trying to maintain everything that we've gained mm -hmm. in the past. You know, I've spent, well, 40 years plus, you know, campaigning on, on independent living. And I, uh, I don't want to see that disappear. That's the last thing I want to see. And that's why I suppose I've always remained uh, quite active. You know, some people haven't, but, uh, you know, to, to do that. So, yeah, we can't, we can't be complacent. That's one thing. We can't be complacent in the future. We have to still continue. I think we have to, we have to encourage younger people to take on uh, you know the initiative and so that they it's their future they have to do it for themselves you know and i know ian has been working quite hard in that area and uh, it's an area that certainly probably deserves as much support as possible um to encourage those young people to mm. be able to do it um and what other ones are there i mean uh, yeah and it's trying to continue to fight those find those champions people yeah. who can be on the inside fighting for our, you know, <clears throat> fighting for our rights and fighting to ensure that independent living is going to survive. What terrifies me now is what's happening. Um, 
in the, in the cost of living, the rise of the cost of living. Uh, oh. It's alarming what's happening now. And I'm sure it's not just this country. It must be all countries because those people who, who are the poorest in society and often disabled people fulfill that role because a lot, many are on benefits. And if you're on universal credit, I really do not know how these people are going to pay for their energy costs anymore, mm. the way they're going to triple. We talk, we, well, we had a headline today saying, you know, it was said that they were going to triple next year. But now we, we uh, they're going to triple this year, you know, because in October they're going to go up again. And uh, it's going to be difficult for everybody but people and disabled people being the lowest, you know, uh, in terms of funding, you know, so many. And COVID's hit, hit disabled people. You know, the amount of disabled people that got killed uh, or died through COVID was far higher than the general population in every yeah. country. I'm sure it was. Certainly was in this country. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's uh, there are big challenges in front of us. Um, but we can't, you know, despite the huge challenges we've had, or we are going to face, which we've never had to face before, we still have to keep on track and do what we can to to overcome it. And, you know, in this country, you know, we had Brexit, you know, which Aww. pounded on us as well. And Brexit, uh, you know, it, it stopped us then being able to use, you know, European funding to... Yeah. to uh, to fund projects in this country, which would have been very helpful, um, you know, considering what's happened ever since 2016 yeah. when when Brexit came in, you know, it was the worst thing that could possibly have happened. And it it, it didn't stop us working together with our, with our European colleagues, you know. You know, we're still, you know, people still identify with Europe and the importance yeah. of it, you know, but that's a different kind of mindset, but I mean, actually, the other thing, yeah, in terms of COVID, what's interesting, there's a study that came out about a few weeks ago that TLAP did, Think Local, Act Personal. And they did a, a survey amongst personal assistant users in this country um, just to see what how they felt, what had changed since COVID. And over okay. 78%, over 78% of to say, but people who were employing PAs said it had become far, far, much, much more difficult to employ PAs wow. now than what it did before. And the situation with the rise in the cost of living is going to amplify that. Yeah. You know, it's going to make it more difficult because, you know, uh, people can get more, people can get more filling shelves in Tesco supermarket than they can. Um, you know, being a PA and stuff. Uh, when it comes down to an hour, it's just, uh, you know, appalling when it comes down to that. Um, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So there's a lot of challenges that we have. That's why we have to, you know, make sure we don't lose the basics. Like, you know, peer support has to be right, right up there. And uh, we still have to support each other. And I know, I think, you know, that, you know, this year at the, at the Freedom Drive has to uh, be be equipped, be ready, re ready for this. Because uh, I think, you know, the, the impact it's going to have on the lives of disabled people is going to, and, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, whether people will even have difficulty traveling, mm. you know, whether that's going to impact on people getting there. You know, because people now are going to have to think, think carefully about where how they spend their money, <laughs> supporting. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. have you thought about that? Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we are obviously we are hoping people will will still um, be able to find funding, you know, to to come. But like you say, it is very difficult. It's it's the um, um, cost of living, and there's still COVID around. Uh, there's yeah. also um, well, COVID the, as well. Yeah, yeah of course, there's I mean, also the war, um, yeah. the war in Europe, uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so there are many, <laughs> there are many, many uh, yeah. difficulties. I mean, we're we are hoping because people have been uh, planning to, you know, 
to come to the Freedom Drive for, exactly. what, what for two, three, two, three years. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're, yeah. We, you know, we're hoping I'm sure they will still come. Yeah. I'm sure they're enthusiastic, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and those who have been before know what it's like and know the buzz and the inspiration yeah. that they can, they can get from being with their... Uh, and it probably could have a... Um, it could also have, you know, a huge unifying factor more than yeah. any other freedom drive before it because people would want to feel more companionship and more comp togetherness, you know, as, as a, a holistic group of people, you know, fighting for the same aims because of basically all these things. We've uh, identified austerity and COVID and the war and, yeah, uh, and, you know, I think uh, the cost yeah. of living is the worst of the lot. You know that. And yeah, like like you say, there aren't there aren't many protests. I mean, you were talking oh, yeah. about the mm -hmm. the UK, but also um, in Brussels, there mm -hmm. there hasn't been any protest um, for in, not only independent living but anything related to the rights of disabled people for mm -hmm. oh, you yeah. know, probably since our last freedom drive. So well, yeah, exactly. uh, it is important oh, yeah. Um, yeah, to get out. Mean, yeah. And unfortunately, EDF are, are not encouraging those kinds of things either, you know. Yeah. Uh, as the Europe, so-called European representative organization of disabled people, you know, they should be encouraging people to do that. But certainly COVID is, is a fact that, I mean, I would be, yeah, I mean, I would be hesitant if I could go, um, mm -hmm. you know, about doing that because I'm not even going, you know, to big, to places where there are lots of people at the moment, you know. So, yeah, so because yeah. I can't afford, can't afford to get it. I only heard a few weeks ago that somebody I know, who in fact was on the Independent Living Committee with us in those days when we set up NCIL and the direct payments legislation, uh, sadly died and he's... Similar again, you know, we were the tetraplegic. Mm. But he was, you know, 10 years younger than me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know. it's a big risk, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But I think, I, yeah, I'm just, just thinking of looking at the other questions. I think you've touched upon um, the role of younger generations. And you've talked about independent living strategies. You talked about... Um, um, you talked a lot about different peer support, peer support yeah, exactly. those kinds of yeah. things. Uh, so maybe just for the conclusion of this interview, um, is there anything that you would like to mention that you that I haven't asked you about or that you haven't thought um, about? I think I've I've covered most things, but yeah, I mean I think we've got to keep on keep on going for those. Or oh, finding those champions that can fight on our behalf because they've always helped us out. There's always been those individuals that within working within the system that can that can do that, you know. Mm. And you know, we've got organizations in this country and I don't know whether other countries have similar more out of touch now with Europe than I have been in the past, like Sky, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, you know, and TLAP. I think local act person that I mentioned who did this um, uh, survey on on people's you know employed people who em who employed uh -huh. PAs you know and that stuff, but yeah, young people is definitely you know where the future is and they've got to take in and uh, yeah, one thing I haven't met mentioned which actually has happened in this country and it, it does show the dichotomy in younger people or younger disabled people. There's um, a new, in the last few years, something called Disability Union has mm -hmm. been set up in the UK. You can find, find it on the internet. And it, it's been set up by quite a lot of young disabled people in this country. Believe it or not, it's been set up just down the road in Southampton. Mm -hmm. That's where they came from, most of them. And uh, they don't seem to want to have anything to do. To, they don't want to identify with the disability movement per se. Mm. And they even call their PAs carers now, which is mm. kind of really going backwards, yeah. you know, in the sense of adopting, you know, they yeah. don't see the language, they don't see the history, they don't want to know the history, I don't think. 
and you've got that part as well you know which is you know if younger people are going in that direction then and they've uh, they've been able to influence actually which is something i haven't mentioned social media okay. um, because they've been doing it that way uh because you can get a lot of this mis misinformation and fake news and all that, mm. all that through, you know through the, through the media social media anyway but it's another thing we can use social media as for our own needs and mm. as much as possible to try and encourage more positive role models for um independent living activists and advocates to try and encourage more to stay on the stay on the plot as it were and stay in the game and yeah not to you know to you know, not identify with it yeah yeah okay younger well people are all doing it you know most young people and now the you know the thing to do these days is it's all gone from facebook to instagram almost from what i can get and <laughs> yeah. tiktok tiktok <laughs> and uh, all the other ones yeah yeah, but it's like you say, it's, it can be positive, but it can be also negative. And yeah, you're going to be so careful. People in the different yeah. directions. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're going to be so careful with what what can happen, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank, uh, thanks very much, John. So we end on this kind of, I don't know if it's positive or negative. <laughs> yeah, well, I always remain optimistic. <laughs> it's like, but despite, I mean, we've never had challenges like this before. And I just, you know, I was reading some awful article about the situation of disabled people in this country so it was a real eye-opener for me about you know the words that were used were you know really like ultra negative mm. in terms of uh the situation we might find ourselves in yeah yeah, yeah that's that's fine but yeah i i remain optimistic and I, and you know i know we've had a lot of um uh, so sort of positive things happen in the past. I think by working together, they can still happen. You know, mm. it's not the end. No, far from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, John. I'm sure people right. will find it really interesting to listen to this. Yeah. Um. And uh, obviously, well, we, we keep in we keep in touch. I will end yeah. the the recording now. So thank you, everyone, for listening to this interview with John Evans.